Let's move on because we want to talk about the weekend's hurling and I want to like to say Tommy Walsh is with us this morning. Tommy, good morning to you. Well, Gerald, Johnny. How are you, Tommy? Before we get into the weekend's hurling, uh, there's pictures all over the papers of Maurizio Sarri this morning. Um, he's very annoyed because a fight broke out in the last training session before the cup final between Gonzalo Higuain and David Luiz. And I was wondering, could you identify with this? The last training session before an all Ireland final, was there ever uh, lads flaking each other in training? <laughs> I presume you're saying that was sarcasm, Jarrah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say if Frank Cody used to walk out of training session every time there was a fight, I'd say we'd never have a manager at train. <laughs> but I suppose there's, there's a big difference. Um, I don't know what happened in the Chelsea training ground, but I suppose ours was all honest and kind of it was in the right spirits. There was never any nasty stuff. There was never any stuff done with bitterness or anything like that, which would be a total different scenario. So all our stuff was healthy. We were all able to go into the dressing room, have the crack, have the laughs afterwards. There was never rapping maybe untoward. So there is a difference, I suppose, if there's, if there's kind of maybe two rivals there in training and they're just kind of having a go at each other, that's probably not good. So um, it depends on the situation. But, yeah, you know, the, the last training session, especially for the big games, they were different, I suppose, in, in, in the hurling <clears throat> that you're playing for your position on the field. Um, because maybe I'd say the team is probably fairly well named uh, in Chelsea there I'd say it's maybe more a rivalry between two guys possibly yeah. just on and Tommy over the year did you suffer many injuries in training because I, I I personally think that the, the, the club um, the club situation where they don't play club and during championship and all that and the club just goes on holiday I think it's a load of nonsense I love the way Kilkenny you saw, you saw always hurl club as well but in training did you ever sustain injuries considering how reportedly physical and, and honest it was yeah, well, I think most of the injuries that, that happen really nowadays are more kind of um, hamstrings and grinds. And lads are pushing their bodies to the limits now, Johnny, that any little kind of um, offset at all, you're kind of in trouble. Towards one time you had a bit of leeway that no one was, we'll say, 100% fit. You know, no one was taken to their bodies to the absolute limits. So any kind of a niggle at all, it didn't really matter as much. Towards now, guys are so finely tuned that hamstring things, grinds, cruciates, it's much more easier to happen. Like, say, that time, when I started, it was around 2000 and, we'll say, two with Kilkenny. You trained probably three times a week. Towards now, you're training seven times a week. So, I think there's a big difference in the demands guys are putting on their bodies now. But as regards hitting each other in training and the physical stuff, there was never really any injuries. Um, because, like, say, if you take soccer or, or that, you're putting in your ankles, you're putting in your, your legs for any tackles. Uh, in train tours and hurling really it's just the hurling hurls are so light nowadays and and that that you get a belt of a hurl it might be sore <laughs> you know you're not really going to come out with too much of an injury bar a guy tries to maybe you know do you really <laughs> <laughs> and on that <laughs> uh, let's talk a little bit about um, Davy Fates of the weekend he's coming from some criticism from um, Brian Lowen in the papers this morning Brian Lowen was doing the uh, the tour of the Legends Tour of Croke Park, and obviously they're former teammates, but there has been a bit of history between them when they were both involved with uh, LIT and UL, and um, Brian Lowen had previously called for a root and branch examination of Clare Hurling after Clare went out of the championship, and Davy apparently thought this was um, kind of aimed at his dad, who obviously was centrally involved in, in running Clare GA for a long time. So there's a bit of bad blood between them, and you have to put that context on it. Um, is he right though? Like, is are Davies antics actually a distraction for the players? Do you think? Again, like it goes back to really um, how it's kind of put in, put out to the team. Like, if you go back to that example you gave at the start of the show about Sarri walking away from Chelsea, like when a guy does that now, it kind of sends out bad messages that there is bad blood and it is affecting the team. Towards say if a manager, you know, say maybe looked at the bigger picture. He might be seeding inside, laugh it off, and off you go, say, oh, this is great. Um, we're showing our hunger, we're showing our fighting spirit before the biggest game of our season, the Europa League final. Well, then that's a kind of a, a different slant to put on it. But I'd say the same with Davy Fitz. If, if you start putting the slant on it, that it's not good for Wexford, it's, 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 it's kind of a sideshow, it's taking the, the, I suppose, the limelight away from the players. Suddenly then, that starts creeping into guys' heads. Uh, it might creep into maybe the family's head. It might uh, creep into the the guys that are in your club, their heads, and suddenly it all starts uh, feeding through to the players. So as if it's put out there that no, it's brilliant and that it's it's really uh, you know they were they were in trouble at the time that Davy Fitz did that, and you could put the slant on it that he really kind of revitalised the team and he got them fighting again. So Ger, 
I think it just depends on what slant you put on it. But, um, you know, he was put off the other day, and I think it's more of a, an issue for, the, the I suppose, the wider GA in that. Do we send out a message? Um, now, I'd say not now. It's too late now. You send it out before the next game. So it's all that has to happen is John Horn or the president of the GA comes out and says, or the, or the Referees Association comes out all over the media all week and say, listen, anyone now, no matter who you are, whether it's the club or whether it's the county, anyone that goes up to a, a third official, you know, in any sort of a way, is you're gone. And just, you know, it's, it's like the rugby, really. I always put it down to the consequences, Jerry. If you think there's massive consequences, you won't do it. Um, like Davey done that the other day because he, he, he knows there was managers and selectors doing it left, right and centre around the country for years and many of them have got away so there's a grey area there towards if it was put out there straight there's going to be you know there's going to be no negotiations it doesn't matter whether you, uh, you're, you're shouting and roaring or whether you just go up to them you're not allowed to go up to the, the third official and that's just end off and I think the consequences you know you get a four week ban or whatever so I think it's the consequences really are are the major uh, talking point. Really, I, I think I think Tommy's spot on there as well. And I think um, the GA does need to lead on this in the sense of zero tolerance towards the sort of nonsense and um, to encourage people to get into refereeing. It's it's um, I, I as far as I know there was. And there has been crises with regard to getting young people to referee in games. It's not attractive, and it's all levels of the game. And um, what I thought, Davy really further let himself down with his comments afterwards, Tommy, where he was like, you know, he wanted to make a name for himself, and in fairness, he did. And I was like, well, you made a name for yourself here, and it wasn't a good name. Yeah, well, I suppose it depends, Johnny, on, on you know, it, it's definitely fifty-fifty on how it split the opinion on this, like. You know, Davy is a guy that inspires so many as well. So you have guys that will jump on on Davy's kind of fence, and then you have guys that will jump on, we'll say Brian Lowe inside the thing. So I think really it's a matter of opinion, and depends on your own probably personality and that. So I suppose to take the to take the personalities out of it, I suppose they could come up with some sort of a rule. Let's move on and talk about the games as we can because um, Waterford and Limerick and Clare Tip are the Munster hurling games. There's obviously one game only in Leinster this weekend. That's Carlow against Dublin. Um, do Waterford have a kick left in them? Or are we are we just writing them off and saying it's automatic now that they're going to lose every game because they're not really that bad a team, are they? No, and the re- the only reason you know, as you know, I tipped them at the start of the year, so they have to have a big push on, <laughs> on Sunday. Or I'm in trouble. Um, but the way I look at it is, are they lose dollar games because they're playing really well and things just aren't working out for them? No. So none of them are in form, Ger. You have to compare them to, we'll say Ger Luck, and I was speaking about the Galway Wexford game at the weekend. I was reading them yesterday and he was just pointing out that, you know, you know if it was a good game or a bad game by picking out a man in the match. And it was very difficult to pick out the man in the match in the Galway Wexford game. Will you go back and compare that to the Watford team uh, of this year? If could could you maybe point out two or three players that are in the form of their lives? You couldn't really. Um, I was thinking about it last night, and the only guy that I could really, I suppose, name that is standing up to it is the fullback Connor Prunty, and he's one of the youngest players on the team. He's playing really, really well and against top top players in the first two games against Clare and versus Tipperary. Um, like he marked Hallen the last day, and he marked a few lads uh, versus Clare as well. Um, and he's playing really well. But other than that, you couldn't pick out a lad that's that's in form. So would I give him a chance? Of course I would, because they just need lads to get in form. I would hope that maybe they like in hurling there's kind of there's three real well, in any sport, there's three three really fundamentals. You have your fitness. I imagine they're all fit at this stage. Then you have the whole spirit and heart. That's another side of things. And then you have tactics, skill we'll say, put them into another group. So Basically, at the moment, if I'm Watford, I'm forgetting about tactics and forgetting about skill. The only thing they need is heart, spirit. Go back to the Watford people. They, they've asked for this home ground for, for, for the last 12 months. They've got it. In the first game, there wasn't that much explosion, much fieriness out of them. Let's go back and just show them fieriness. We've seen John Myler uh, picking the Cork team the last day, Ger. He basically said that he wasn't picking his team anymore on skill. He was picking them on work rate. And look at the response that that got out of the Cork guys the last day. Like, you couldn't really compare Cork's first performance versus Tipperary versus these two first performance versus the first two performances for Watford. 
And, um, you know, you'd wonder, Cork, after the first, could they ever come out with uh, another good performance? And suddenly they came out with an absolutely brilliant performance against the All-Ireland champions. So, yeah, give them a great chance. But one thing they have to do is come out with some fairness. Can I um, just ask you a little bit about the general standard of the championship so far, then? Because it's interesting, the point about the uh, man of the match. And, uh, OK, so there's been great performances from individuals on the Tipperary team and Tipperary performances, maybe if we put them on a bit of an island. But has the standard generally just not been as good this year or was last year where we all spoiled a little bit or what's your take? Yeah, well, you see, we're, we're just we're not far enough into it, really. Like like last year, like there was such great um, performances from teams and still losing towards this year. The teams that are losing are not playing well, Ger. It's not that two guys went at it like two fighters in a boxing ring when Rocky Balboa and went pound for pound, you know. These guys, one of them is playing really well on a given day and one of them is playing poorly. There's no one coming out playing one of the greatest matches. Like you don't hear anyone saying that was an absolute epic. So, yeah, we're, we're finding hard this year so far, but there's still a good few games to go in it. Like This is only Limerick's second game. Um, for everyone else, it's their third game. But, yeah, no, listen, you could definitely make the point that teams aren't in the same form as they were last year. It, it is going to take off, though, isn't it? Galway going to Nolan Park. That's going to be an absolutely massive game. Obviously, Limerick on the back of losing to Cork. And uh, I, I, I think it was DJ Carey who was writing this morning in one of the papers. This, um, he's found it very kind of underwhelming. But I, I think, Tommy, you can feel maybe that, you know, it's just it is early days. It will take off. Yeah, and I suppose last year was just... The creme de la High standards, yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, I was watching Summer Hurling during the Christmas, Johnny, and like, you could watch, pick out any of the games, and they're all absolute epics. Um, go back straight to the semi finals, like we said, the semi finals last year was the greatest weekend in, in hurling in the history of the GEA, and it was because we thought the Galway and Clare game, the other in semi final, wouldn't be matched, and we even got a better game the following day. So, yeah, I think we're, we're probably not seeing as, as many epics this year. Tommy, I know that um, the legend Dick Walsh has passed away in, in Tullerone. Can you tell us a bit about him? Yeah, so Dick of the Church, he was 100 there last year, 101 this year. Um, just a fantastic uh, character in the parish. Like uh, I was kind of explaining to the, the local radio station the other day, like when I got to know him, he was in his 70s, which was in the early 90s, and he's still going to, to, to as far as today. You'd be talking about, I heard you, heard you speaking about the... Uh, was it the dairy guys and, and maybe you know expenses and you know the the, th the amount that is spent on teams but you have physios you have your masseurs and that the, the church was our masseur back in the in the 90s just a local guy 70 years of age he had a you know some sort of a concoction in an old bottle that he met up at home and you know you didn't ask any questions and he just rubbed that into you and anyone that wanted a rub got a rub and that's the kind of character you're dealing with like he played in the 47 county final at Tullerone won. So that's the kind of time span you're talking about with this guy. Just an absolute brilliant character. And like if you shook his hand, you'd be there for 10 minutes and you'd, 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 you'd be questioning your toughness after because <laughs> you'd have a sore hand coming off. So yeah, he was one of these guys. And uh, just really, you know, I suppose he, he was a role model. Like <clears throat> people, you know, speak about us guys that, you know, we love where we're from in Tullerone. Well, we got that from the likes of him because he was just a taller old man out and out and he was the role model for all of us. Tommy, great stuff this morning. Thanks a million for joining us. Thanks, guys.